I am so pumped to be here. I couldn't wait to be with you all. Thank you guys, you are like legends. And I was busting um, to be here. I feel like it's been, we've been here for two decades or something. And um, I am probably old enough to be everyone's mother in the room, even though I can't see you. Um, I'm assuming, is there people out there? All right, you're going to have to talk back to me today because I'm by faith, I'm believing that I'm speaking to somebody out there. Like, this is so dark. I don't know. I mean, we've gotten so trendy, but for elderly people like me, I'm like, where are you all? And so um, it, it, this church will always have the most special, special place in my heart because I feel like we've been doing life together. If you're new, I'm just like your cray-cray Aussie Aunt Chris. So just so that you know, that's where I fit in. And I so love um, Pastor Tim and Nicola. And I think God's to speak to us today. Now, for those of you that don't know, I am married to the single most ravishing piece of masculine flesh on planet Earth. And so Nick and I have been married for 28 years next week. And we have, uh, I know, it's pretty awesome. If you could do anything for 28 minutes nowadays. And we have two daughters, Catherine Bobby, who's 22, and she was coming here. She was. She did her second year in college full-time here in London. And so she was part of this congregation all of last year. And she's so bummed that she's not here with me because she's this is her favorite church in the world. And then um, we have our 18-year-old, Sophia. And so my husband is number 14 of 15 kids. So his mother had 15 full-term pregnancies in 17 years, which is a lot. I know, there was no television in that part of Australia. And so, <laughs> like none. And my mother-in-law, she never thought you were a chick until you like popped out 10 kids. And so I would take Catherine Bobby and I'd say, this is my Catherine and she is my Alpha. And then I'd take Sophia and I'd say, this is my uh, Sophia Joyce and she is my Omega. And this is the beginning and the end of my childbearing years. This is where it all ends and they are the absolute delight of our life. And my husband's actually in Cape Town. He would be here with me. And I was trying to get a video ready, but because I'm technologically challenged, I didn't know how to do it. But he's doing a race called the Cape Epic, which for those of you that might know, it's um, eight days and I think it's 600 miles and uh, 60,000 feet of elevation. So it's like you just, you just ride a mountain bike for 10 hours a day up mountains um, on very technical trails. And he's doing it uh, to raise funds for A21 and you guys have been on the A21 journey with us from day one, literally. We are 16 years old and I'm so thrilled. I know some of you that have been around that long, 16 years and what started as just a, a dream from Thessaloniki, Greece. We've now got 19 offices in 14 countries around the world and have seen literally thousands of men, women and children rescued and um, hundreds of traffickers that have been uh, convicted and sentenced and in jail, which is like pretty awesome as well to stop it at that level. We just um, came from a trip to Greece in Athens where we're about to open. We've got a, our headquarters in Thessaloniki. We're about to open our Athens office. But in one raid, I was just with the anti-trafficking authority, uh, the head of anti-trafficking in Greece. And because we run the national hotline in Greece and in Spain, that because of tip-offs to our hotline and us working with uh, the anti-trafficking authorities in Greece and Spain in one raid, in one apartment in Greece, there were 52 Colombian women rescued and 22 traffickers caught that we are prosecuting constantly just now. So there, I mean, I could tell you story after story, but I want you to know that your years of faithful giving has, has reaped um, and is producing unbelievable results around the world. And we are truly believing that together we will abolish slavery everywhere forever. It will happen. And we're gonna keep in this fight until it does happen. So I'm so grateful to God. And you know, I'm both Greek and a woman, guys. So I only speak three ways, hard, fast, and continuously. So, um, you know, Nicola has said, you have only got this much time and then you self combust. So I'm gonna dive right into the word. I want us to, tell, to turn to Isaiah. In England, do you say Isaiah? Say it for me. That's cool, because I've been living in America too long, and they're like, Isaiah. I'm like, whatever, whatever that is. But anyway, so it's, you know, we, we're like your colony down from Australia. It's nice to be back in the motherland. I just want to say I felt it. You know, we serve a God that loves new things. 
Uh, you and I are, are part of a new covenant. God's mercy is a new every morning. God has given us a new commandment um, that we are to love one another as He has loved us. God really likes new. Sometimes we, we love to just focus on old, but we're told to sing a new song unto the Lord. And all throughout Scripture, God who never changes, and this is the mystery and the beauty of a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is always doing doing something new. A God that changes not, it's constantly doing something new. I thank God for that because I love new and I love fresh and God loves that as well. We're going to go to Isaiah 43 verse 13. I will go verse uh, 14. This is what the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says. Because of you, I will send an army to Babylon and bring them all out as fugitives, even the Chaldeans in the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. This is what the Lord says, who makes a way in the sea and a path through raging waters. Everyone say through. Who brings out the chariot and horse, the army and the mighty one together. They lie down for they do not, and they do not rise again. They are extinguished, put out like a wick. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. So here, the prophet Isaiah is prophesying this about a hundred years before the children of Israel are already going to go into Babylonian captivity. So before they ever get there, he gives them this prophetic word. He writes this prophetic word knowing that they're going to go into Babylonian exile. God has warned them time and time again. If you don't stop disobeying me, if you don't stop living in your own ways, if you don't uh, stop your idolatry and your ignorance and your looking over the poor and the marginalized, then this is not gonna go well. God has got incredible mercy. God has got incredible grace and he gives us lots of warnings, but he's speaking to his children and he's saying for your own good, Stop the idolatry. Stop worshiping foreign gods. Stop just pursuing whatever it is that you want to do in your flesh. Stop neglecting the thing that is closest to my heart, the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed. And if you don't, you will suffer the consequences of that. And that's exactly what happened. There was the Assyrian conquest and then the Babylonians. And so the children of Israel went into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. So the prophet is prophesying this 100 years before they ever get there, knowing that in about 150 years, you are going to need to read these words of encouragement. You are going to need to read the fact that there is hope. It's not over. God's not finished with you. There's still a plan and there's still a purpose. You are going to need to read that. So the children of Israel are reading that when they're well and truly into their Babylonian captivity. And it seems like everything is hopeless. It seems like they are never going to return back to Jerusalem. They're never going to go back to their homeland. That there is no hope. It is all finished. God has forgotten them. God has forsaken them. There is no chance in the midst of that, the Lord says to them, oh no, do not remember former things. I, I, I've done some miracles in the past. I've done something great. He starts with saying, don't you, don't, don't you remember that I'm the God that brought you out of slavery, out of Egypt. I parted the Red Seas and, and, and I made a way where there was no way. It was impossible. It seemed like after 430 years of bondage and slavery, you were never going to get free. You were never going to come out from under Pharaoh's uh, rule. You were never going to step into freedom. But I made a way where there was no way. I made a way through the Red Sea. You know, we all want to be delivered from things, but God often takes us through things. And He was reminding them, I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I know it seems like there is no hope. And I know you want to be delivered from it. But just because I'm not delivering you from it doesn't mean I'm not taking you through it. And often we think God has forsaken us and God has forgotten us because we're in the through process rather than the delivered from process. But as God is taking us through, He's preparing us for the thing that He's already prepared for us. He's conforming us and transforming us into His image. He's actually literally changing us from the inside out so that when we come through, we're an entirely different person ready for what it is that He's got for us. He said, I'm the God that's bringing you through. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but I have no doubt everyone's going through something. 
Some of you have got a, a sickness and, and, and you are going through treatment and you're believing God and you're praying. And you're like, God, have you forgotten me because you don't seem to have delivered me from it? But your God's with you in it and he'll bring you through it. You know, one of the greatest promises and probably for me the most precious promise in the Bible is the promise that God is always with us and will never leave us nor forsake us. Trust me, as you get older, you're gonna wanna hang on to that. You're gonna think, God, I, I just want great promises that you're gonna give me a lot of stuff and you're gonna make me really famous and it's gonna be awesome. And the older you get, you're just like, thank you, God, that you will never leave me nor forsake me. A lot of people will, but God won't. He's with you through it. He will bring you through it and he will make a way where there is no way. In the same way that he parted a Red Sea, he's able to still part Red Seas in your life. Just hang on. Even, I, I'm really lab laboring this at this moment because there's some of you that are on the edge of your faith because you are thinking, if God is really God, he would deliver me from this thing. And he's saying, would you find my presence in it and I'll bring you through it. Don't give up and don't quit. He's the God of through all the way through the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. He's a God that brings us through. You know, in Exodus 14, 21 to 22, it says, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into the dry land. So the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. God is a God that brings you through. He's reminding them in Isaiah, and this is hundreds of years later, that I am going to bring you through. If I did it before, I can do it again. He's brought you through before, he'll bring you through again. He hasn't left you, he hasn't forsaken you, he hasn't forgotten you. He brought us through before, he'll bring you through again. So as he's going on, he starts off by reminding them, didn't I do it before? I know you're in captivity. I know you're in bondage. I know you've lost hope. I know you think I've forgotten you, but I did it before. And because I did it before, I can do it again. But then he goes in the very, after he's just reminded them that he's brought them through, after he's just reminded them of the miracles that he's done in the past, the next thing he says is, do not remember the former things. And you're like, what are you going on about God? You have just told us, you yourself have just reminded us of what it is that you did before. The fact that you made a way where there was no way, the fact that what's impossible with man is possible with God, that you parted a Red Sea, that you delivered us before, you've just told us to remember. And in fact, the entire Torah, the entire um, early books, of the, the, the five books of the Bible that Moses wrote are all focused and woven into the Jewish DNA is the focus of don't forget what I did for you. Don't forget that you were once slaves in Egypt and I delivered you through the Exodus. The entire Passover was established and to this day is still remembered in order to remember what God has done. In fact, it is woven right through the history of the Jewish people is do not forget, do not forget, do not forget. I'm gonna show you from Scripture. We see that the Passover was instituted to do this from Exodus 12, 14. This day is to be a memorial for you and you must celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You are to celebrate it throughout your generation as a permanent statute so that you never forget what I did. It's permanent. Deuteronomy 15, 15. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That's why I'm giving you this command today. Deuteronomy 24, 18. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I've commanded you to do this today. Deuteronomy 24, 22. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, can you see a theme here? Remember, remember, remember. And I could take you to Scripture after Scripture. Do not forget, remember, do not forget, remember. And now we're in Isaiah and it says, do not remember. You're like, okay. Do you, what's going on here, God? You've established this whole thing to tell us not to forget and to remember. And now you're saying, do not remember former things. Now, of course, God's not saying, get amnesia and forget what happened as if it didn't happen. No, no, what he's saying to them is you are so focused on remembering how I did it before 
that you are forgetting that the miracle is in the who, not the how. So what you are looking for is for me to do a 2.0 version of what I've already done but I'm not doing it the same way anymore. Behold, I do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And while you keep looking back to look at me doing it the same old way, I didn't say I'm gonna do the same thing in the same way. I said, I'm doing a new thing in a new way. I'm the God that delivered you before. I'm the God that's gonna deliver you again, but you are so obsessed with the how that you're missing the who. So he says, do not remember. Don't get fixed and fixated on the methodology. Don't get so fixated on the how, because you've already worked out how you think God's gonna deliver you from this thing. In fact, you think you could give God some tips on how He could do it better. How He could fix that person, how He could open that door, how He could make this circumstance happen. And so often we miss God because we're looking for a certain methodology. And in fact, what we want is God to do what He did before in the same way, but just in a younger version. Let me give you an example. When Samuel the prophet, the Lord said to him in 1 Samuel 16, I have anointed for myself, I've chosen for myself a new king. He, he was done with Saul. So Samuel went to Jesse's house so that he could find the new king. And Jesse had eight sons, but he only brought seven sons before the prophet Samuel. David was out in the field and his father didn't even recognize him enough and didn't value him enough to even bring him in for the parade. And so when Samuel went to Jesse's house, the scripture says he saw Eliab and thought. Eliab was the oldest son of Jesse. Eliab was a younger version of Saul. He was tall, he was good looking, he was a fighting man. He was very, very similar to Saul in temperament, in looks, in physique. So the scripture says Samuel the prophet saw Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But what happened was Samuel saw a younger version of Saul. But God didn't say, I'm going to do a younger version of Saul. He said, I've chosen a new king. We confuse new with next. We want the next version of the same thing in a younger body. But God says, I'm not doing the next version of the same thing in a younger body. I'm doing a whole new thing. And that's very much predicated on the way that culture is. We, we want like, who's the next Taylor Swift? Who's the next Justin Bieber? Who's the next? We want a younger version of the same thing. But God says, I'm not doing a younger version of the same thing. Thing, I'm doing a brand new thing. And we have to watch that in our church life and in our own lives. I'm going, okay, am I the next this? There is no next anyone. God only makes one of everyone. But He's doing a new thing. And He says to them, do you not perceive it? Most of us don't perceive it because we're looking for the next thing and not the new thing. So the prophet missed it because he was looking for the next Saul. But God wasn't doing a next Saul. He was doing a new king. And here's the deal. The prophet got it wrong in that instance. Now he turned it around, of course, because the Lord said to him, no, that's, that's not who I've chosen. The father of the house got it wrong because he didn't even bring David out to parade him. But God never gets it wrong. The prophet can get it wrong. The father of the house can get it wrong. God will never get it wrong. If God has assigned you, God will find you. So if you continue to stay faithful where God has called you, the prophet can get it wrong. The father of the house can get it wrong. But God's not looking for the next anyone. He's looking for the new thing that he's done. And if we stay faithful where he has planted us, then God will find us if he's assigned us. And so you stay faithful. So in the midst of all of that, he's looking for the next. And a lot of us, miss what God has for us because we're looking for the next thing which is really a younger version or a 2.0 version of what God did before. And we are living in pivotal times in 2024. The planet has shifted. The tectonic plates of the planet, spiritually speaking, have shifted. The world is not the world we even lived in five years ago and it's not going back. So many people are longing, man, I just wish we could go back to normal. There is no going back to anything. There is the world we live in now and God has graced us and God has anointed us and God has sent us to this world. It's not like God's in heaven going, whoa, I had no idea what was happening in the world in 2024. Peter, why didn't you tell me? I mean, Bartholomew, why could you not have told me the state of the political world in 2024? 
Why didn't you tell me what it would be like economically or sociologically or morally or environmentally? It's not like God's in heaven freaking out about the condition of the world. He has assigned us to this time in history. He has filled us with His Holy Spirit and He has sent us to be salt and light in a lost and a broken world. We have everything we need to do what God has called us to do in our generation. He's saying, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Everywhere I travel around the world, and I've just come from South America and then Asia, and then uh, I was in Spain, and now I'm here, and it doesn't matter which continent I've gone to, which country I've gone to, you can see a sense that God is doing a new thing. While all the naysayers are talking negatively about, at the condition of the world politically or economically or sociologically or morally or environmentally and the naysayers just continue to say it's hopeless there's no future just like they were when they were the children of Israel were in Babylonian captivity and everything was negative and everything was hopeless and it seemed like there was no way forward God's saying hey I'm actually doing something don't you see it but you're looking for what I did before I'm not doing what I did before I'm doing a brand new thing and if you would come to me I'll take the scales off your eyes and I will show you that I am still moving, that I am still moving on this earth. I'm still reaching people. I'm still delivering people. I'm still healing people. I'm still saving people. Behold, I do a new thing. And a lot of us are in that middle road. Do we perceive it? Can you see it? Or are you looking for what He did and for Him to do it that way again? Or are you looking to the God that is the God of miracles that is doing a brand new thing. So he's saying, I did it like that. You can be inspired by the past, but it's time to focus on the future. And in every aspect of our life, there is no going back to normal because there is no going back. There is just now. And the same God that did it then is the same God that will do it now. He is the source, not the method, not the system. It's God. He alone is the one that does miracles. He alone is the one that makes a way where there is no way. And if we get so caught up in the methodology and the way He did it, then we're only going to be disappointed because He's not doing it that way again. He's not doing it that way again. So He says... Do you not see it? See, so many of us, we're spending all of our time scrolling and swiping through everyone else's life that we don't have time to see what God's doing. And if we spent less time scrolling and swiping through everyone else's life, we might just live the one and only life God's put us on this earth to live. Greatest distraction of our generation is comparing and competing and swiping and scrolling. And it's just a distraction because God's like, I've got this life for you to live. I've got this purpose for you to live. I've got this destiny for you to live, but if you spend all your time looking at what everyone else is doing, how will you see what I'm doing? And it's time for us to stop being distracted and to start focusing. What is it that the Lord's doing on the earth? Because He's not silent, He's moving. He's doing things everywhere. There is a sense of the palpable presence of God that is moving, that is making a difference. But we are being so consumed and overwrought. And if you just step out and took a 35,000 foot view and go, whoo, look at the planet. There's not a country, there's not a continent on the earth where there doesn't seem to be like darkness and chaos and confusion in every realm of life, politically, socially, morally, environmentally, spiritually. You go, you don't even need to be a prophet to go, whoo. This is a very important moment on the earth. And the enemy thinks he's having a field day. And in fact, in some areas he is. But for those of us that continue to trust in our faithful God, we will see that even in the midst of the darkness, God is making a way where there seems to be no way. That God is still doing what He's always done. Signs, wonders, and miracles. That our God is still a faithful God. Still saving, still delivering, still healing, still making a way where there is no way. What He's looking for is a people of faith that will believe that He is who He says He is, that He can do what He says He can do. And He would say in London, do I still have a church that believes that I am who I say I am, that I can do what I say I can do, that we can see transformation in our nation? Because He's still doing it, but He's doing a new thing in a new way, using a new generation. And will we be a people that say, God, I wanna see what you're doing? The fact is that in Matthew 9, 17, let me read you this. He says, 
and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined. No, they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. So here, Jesus was talking to John's disciples in the, oh, that was good, in the context of fasting. And Jesus was saying to them, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. And I need you to hear this. He said, because if you do, what happens is because of the fermentation process with wine, that the gases that are being emitted with new wine, you need a very flexible wineskin so that the gases and, and the wine can be fermented. So you can't put it into an old wine skin because it, it's, it's been used and it's been weathered and there's no elasticity in it. And so they use predominantly goat skins at this time for that and the, because the, the fresh animal skins were very flexible, very malleable. And so you would put the new wine into those wine skins because there was room for expansion for all of the gases so that the wine could ferment and it could actually then you know, be wine that you can drink. Like just because you put new wine into a new wine skin, you don't drink that wine immediately because it tastes like sour grapes. You've got to give it time. Now in the old wine skin, Jesus never said that the goal is to destroy the old wine skin. He said, we don't put new wine into an old wine skin lest we tear that wine skin and then lest the wine falls out and ultimately it's wasted. It doesn't do what it was meant to do. So what we have is a generation wanting to rip up all the old wineskins and Jesus said, I never told anyone to rip any old wineskin up because there's still some really good wine. In fact, if you go to a restaurant, I know none of you drink, but assuming anyone ever did, if you went to a restaurant and there was some good wine that hadn't gone off, that was sitting in a bottle for 40 or 50 years, that's actually more valuable, tastes better and more mature than a young wine. Plenty of good drinking left there. But if you go just ripping all the old wineskins, then a whole lot of that wine is wasted. The only time the old wineskin is useless is if the wine has gone off in it. That's when it's useless. Our job isn't to go and just rip up because God uses everything. And then new wine, let me tell you what's equally as dangerous as drinking off wine out of an old wineskin is drinking wine that's not yet matured in a new wineskin. So we have a generation go, whoo, look at my wineskin, man. It's cooler, it's trendier, it's better. I'm anointed, I'm gifted, I should be there. And yet it takes time for character to be formed. It takes time for wisdom to be formed. And if you pour that wine out prematurely, it needs to be spat out because it's not yet palpable or palatable. And so you've always got to have old wineskins and new wine fermenting at the same time developing at the same time. The wisdom is to know which to drink when. And so Jesus is saying, well, you don't put what I'm doing, the new thing, into that packaging. That doesn't dismiss that packaging. That's got a purpose. But I've got a purpose here for the new wine and the new wine skin as well. So you need to be constantly developing that and constantly making sure you've got that because I'm continuing to do a new thing. So in the midst of all of that, as we're at a time in history on the earth where there's plenty of good old wineskins with good wine in it and a whole lot of new wineskins being developed with new wine in it, wisdom says, okay, I'm not looking back at old methodology. If the old wine can be poured into the new world, then that's great. It still got, can be drunk in that context. And as we continue to develop new wine and new wineskins, we're looking for the new way that God is doing things and we're not gonna look back. I know that back then, God led a generation out of slavery by parting a Red Sea. So the children of Israel walked out on dry ground. Should have been wet, but it was dry because He made a way through the Red Sea. When the children of Israel were going another generation, so that was a particular time, in a particular place, and it was with a particular people. They were slaves coming into the wilderness. God did it a certain way. Then a whole nother generation rose up in the wilderness, and they were going into the promised land, and God made a way in the River Jordan, where again they walked on dry ground through the water. 
Now it wasn't exactly the same because it was a similar miracle, not exactly the same. He parted the Red Sea, there were huge walls, they walked through it. He pushed back a river Jordan, they walked through it. I'll show you in Joshua 4, 23, it says, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before until you had crossed over, just as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we crossed over. In both of those cases, he did it that way. Two different groups of people in two different times of history that needed God to move in a certain way. But now they're in Babylonian captivity, a whole different group of people, a whole different time in history. And they were going back home to Jerusalem. And the Lord's like, hang on, I'm not doing it how I did it back then. You're a different group, it's a different time, and I'm doing it a different way. Now what I'm gonna do back then, I made a way through the water on dry ground. But now I'm gonna put rivers in the desert. I'm flipping it. I'm doing it entirely different. And if you keep looking at how I did it before, you're gonna miss how I'm doing it now. And in fact, how I'm doing it now is the exact opposite of how I did it before. Instead of you walking through dry ground, now you are going to have rivers in the desert. And so don't miss how I'm doing it now because you're looking at how I did it then. We've got to understand, God doesn't always use the same methods even though He's always the same God. Nothing changes about Him but how He does it. And some of us are missing missing the fresh move of God right now because we keep looking at the old move of God. And in Psalm 85, 6, let me finish with this. It says the psalmist, it's beautiful. He says, revive us. Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? In 2024, God is doing it an entirely different way. But what we need is our own revival. God, will you not revive us? He didn't say, could you send the same revival again? Now I've lived through a revival throughout my life. I've had the privilege, front row seat, to see God sweep across the earth and through our church in a mighty, mighty way. But the fact is that God is doing a new thing in a new way because it's a new day with a new group of people. But this is the one thing that can't change. The psalmist didn't say, God, send it out of the sky again. He said, would you not revive us again? The revival starts in us. And we're waiting for God to pour it out. And he's saying, no, I'm pouring it through you. We pray theologically inaccurate prayers. God said revival in London. He goes, I did, I sent you. And out of you will flow rivers of living water. Our job, I wonder, could God do a new thing in the same old place? Could God do a new thing in the same old school you're gonna go to, the same old university you're gonna go to, the same old job you're gonna go to, the same old community you're gonna go to, because this revival is gonna be nameless and faceless. And God's saying, I wanna do a new thing and I wanna do it in the same old place. And the key is that you are revived again so that out of you will flow rivers of living water. I believe our greatest days are ahead of us. But our prayer needs to be, Like the psalmist, God, would you revive me again? Would you revive me again? And out of you will flow rivers of living water and our God would do a brand new thing in the same old place. And the same old place is wherever you are, revival arrives. But there's gotta be a hunger and a thirst in you.